Oh, sorry, my need my crack here. Shall we make a start? Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Because the sooner we start, the sooner. I assume I'm the only person now standing between you and lunch and a Christmas break. Is that right? So we have to make it short. Yeah. I hope you all sort of have digested the, the news, the political news? Do you actually know where the word Tory comes from? <laughs> Tory. You know? Well, I mean, it's like no, 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 no. Tory, the word Tory, the expression Tory. Oh, no. Is an Irish word? It's Irish, yeah, and it means robber. <laughs> Look it up on Wikipedia. Robber or bandit or, you know, scoundrel or something like that. I'm not making it up, right? Okay. I have no idea who came up, yes, I do have an idea, but I'm not telling you, who came up with this idea to, to, to schedule a hardcore statistics lecture uh, in the afternoon of the last day of term. I mean, dude, we need to talk. Uh, let's just simply do it as quickly as possible. Because all of you, 
all of you have to do some data analysis in your final year project. Uh, obviously, the people who do the lab projects, you have to analyze data, it goes without saying. People who do communication projects, yes, you have to analyze data. And people who do just, uh, just, not just, people who do um, literature reviews or something like that, you have to analyze some data. Yeah? And even if it is just say, I have. Uh, looked at 123 journals, and out of these 123 journals, 50 say um, it's a good thing to smoke, and the rest says it's a bad thing to smoke. Well, that's sort of kind of data analysis, if you like. Yeah. So, but what I really want you to do is, I want you to start always thinking about data and what they actually mean. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find it on my, on, on my photo stream. But last year, I went to Bournemouth, and there was I saw a fantastic uh, sign up on the road. This is a very dangerous road. OK, it's a dangerous road. I can see that. Roads are usually dangerous. Uh, there were 16 cyclists died on this road in the last five years. That was there. That was, the, that was all that was there. And of course you think, oh, flipping heck, 16 cyclists in the last five years? This is not good because you know, we don't want anyone to die. And usually people would just simply accept it. Oh my god, 16 cyclists dead in the last five years? This is dangerous. So be extra careful. But then, if you think about it, and if you do the proper analysis, and compare it with the result, no cyclist died within a year, you will find that 16 cyclists in five years is no more dangerous than zero cyclist in one year. So actually, that road is not terribly dangerous at all. It's just people want you to believe it is dangerous, and therefore they use data to sort of trick you. I am not going to show you how to do this analysis, because I've, uh, I'm currently writing a sort of a uh, little bit of data analysis um, worksheet for you, and at the end I will give you the QR code. I will also put that on the group chat and I will put it on Moodle. So that gives you sort of ideas how you can analyze data, uh, what partic particular data uh, you can use for a particular test. And I let you to uh, leave it up to you to figure out how you can do that. Look at that. It's free of charge, of course. Um, and hopefully you will find that useful. But I really want you to think about analyzing data. And I thought uh, I'd just try to instill that with you in you with a few pictures. So, go on. Ah, yeah. When we get data, we usually have to make a decision what kind or what do I want to do with these data? And that really determines how we are going to analyze these data. So either we can treat these data as the entire population. This is basically, we have all the information that we ever need, that we will ever get about this particular thing. So we can really accurately describe the entire picture. Our data represent the entire picture. So for example, population mean, population variance, population standard deviation. And to describe this data, we use the tools of descriptive statistics. Simples. And that's really straightforward and easy. You all know how to calculate the mean. You probably can remember how to 
determine a population variance, and so on and so forth. Absolutely trivial. But to be perfectly honest, who gives a flying flamingo? This is the experiment, for example, when you do an experiment. This is an experiment that you, for example, do on a Thursday morning while you are still hungover from the venue. And you just do this with this particular pipette and, and things like that. Who cares about this experiment? Nobody. Maybe, if you are lucky, your supervisor, right? But usually not even that. Because what we are really interested in is we are not, let me, let me, let me sort of uh, exemplify that. If I just simply want to measure the height of people, right? So I measure the, the, the height of these three lovely individuals here. Who cares, right? I don't care how tall they are. But what I really want to know is how tall are, is on average, are the students in here, right? So this is, I take a sample, and from this sample, I try to figure out the wider population. So our data, your data, will represent only a small part of the population. And we cannot 100% accurately describe the whole population, the whole picture. We only have small pieces of puzzle. And we can only try to guesstimate what the picture looks like based on you know, the sample that we have. And in your experiments, you will only take samples. You can describe these samples, again, descriptive statistics, but honestly, nobody cares about that. What we really want to know is the bigger picture. Yeah? And that's, 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 really, that's really important. And whenever you take a sample, whenever you do an experiment, it really depends on who you choose for your sample or what the experiment that you choose for your sample. So when I say I want to know the, the, the average height of all the students in here or all the students uh, at the university or all the students uh, in the UK, and I take a sample, my guesstimate will be different if I just take these three or these three or these three, it will be different, inevitably. Yeah? This is what is generally known as sampling error. And the word error doesn't mean that you make a mistake. It is just simply inherent in your sample. Sampling error is always there when you work with samples. It's a little bit like herpes. Um, you can't avoid it. It's there. Yeah? No chance. Sampling error is like herpes. But what we can do is actually we can try to get a sort of a good idea of the range in which the whole picture is. So for example, if you look at these uh, puzzle pieces or the sample, you then can sort of almost guesstimate that these bits here, which do not represent the entire picture, are actually a picture of the Mona Lisa. And just by looking at that, you can say, right, I have sort of an idea. And that is what we call the confidence <coughs> interval. So the confidence interval is you're looking at these bits here and say, right, we can be fairly confident. I think I need to dim the lights a little bit because I need to ask you what we see here. How do I dim the lights? Um, ah, sorted. 
Can't be bothered. What is the switch here? No. Oh yeah, cool. Hey, brilliant. Okay, so looking at these things, we can sort of guesstimate that the picture from which we have these samples, these pieces, could be one of these three, three paintings. So, I don't ask you who painted that. Who did? I just ask you. Huh? Da Vinci, of course. With a very characteristic <laughs> smile. Do you know why she smiles? Mm -hmm. She's getting her picture taken. That's actually a good answer. That's a good answer. Well, I heard that they did some analysis, and the true reason is she just farted and <laughs> was waiting. It was a sort of a ninja fart, you know, the <laughs> silent but deadly. And she's waiting for the artist to pass out. Okay, who painted that one? You're absolutely right. It's the lady with the ermine. That's this, uh, you know, this ferret thingy. Who painted that? Absolutely right, yes. It's all Da Vinci's. If you have one of those at home, you know, don't throw it away. Uh, <laughs> if it's the original. So, we can say, just looking at the pieces that we have, we are fairly confident that it, these pieces come from one of these paintings. Right? That is our confidence level. Or that is determined by confidence level. Now, when we look at these pieces, we can all also be fairly confident that these pieces don't come from either of those. Artist? No? No? Pop art person. Yeah. Pop art? Roy? Roy Lichtenstein, exactly. Yeah? Lots of money worth. Typical artist? Huh? Picasso, absolutely right. Yeah? So we can look at the sample and say, with a reasonable amount of confidence, these pieces do not come from these paintings. Yeah? Again, that is a confidence interval. And from each set of these pieces, we can construct a possible set of paintings, and we can disregard other paintings. In a way, what we do is we have a sample and we reconstruct the full picture. We cannot be 100% sure about the full picture, but we can be fairly certain that we are on the right track. Yeah? That is what a confidence interval does. And for each sample that you do, for each experiment, you can construct a confidence interval. There are different tools, and I show you the link then, uh, where I describe how you can do it. Uh, it depends a little bit on your data, but for each sample that you do, for each experiment that you do, you can construct a confidence interval. We can even compare two samples with each other. And for each set, we try to reconstruct the underlying picture. What do I mean? Well, we have this set of samples, and we can be fairly confident that this comes from the Mona Lisa. We have this set of sample pieces, we can be fairly confident that it comes from that. So we can compare these. We can say we are also, we can say that 
this set probably does not belong because there's no blue in it, right? Although my wife thinks I'm colorblind, but it's a different story. Yeah, so we can compare samples with that. Just simply, from the sample, we reconstruct the possible picture and then say, are these two pictures the same? Confidence interval. Now, in the literature, you find very often also a different concept, which is the p-value. So what the heck is a p-value? It is basically asking exactly in the reverse order. Instead of saying, what does the full picture look like? What we actually say is, right, we have a picture here in mind. What would the pieces look like? What is the probability that we get certain pieces? And we can say, right, which one is more likely to get if we've got this picture? Which one is more likely, this one or this one? The first one, this one, right? Yeah? This is more likely. So what we can do is we can actually find a probability, the probability actually that we get this sample if and when we have this picture in mind. And this p-value, that is the probability. So, what is the probability to get the observed set of pieces if we have this certain picture? So here, the probability is pretty high, let's say 60-70% that we get this picture. We could, however, have a slightly different picture, but you know, they could still come from a different picture, but nevertheless, if we have this picture in mind, us. 60-70% that we get this sample. What is the probability that if we have this picture that we get this one? What would you say? Zero. Zero? Actually, yeah, maybe. Maybe you have a really big picture of the Mona Lisa and there are some bits in here uh, maybe in here, in this little bit, which are actually a little bit blue. Yeah, it could, it, could, it could very well be. Yeah, so I would not say it's zero. We can't totally exclude it, but the probability is very likely. The probability is very low. It's very unlikely that we get this from that. Yeah, and therefore we say because the probability is not very high, we just simply say no that does not come from this one. And that basically is the principle of a p-value. So you have the concept of the confidence interval and the concept of the p-value. Both are very often used as either or when you report that, for example, in your write-up. Very, very often you find that in scientific journals, you just see a p-value. So if you look at experiments, you see p-value, p is very small, so it's probably not coming from the sample. And people are quite reluctant then. No, I'll tell you later. So this is basically what I told you. We are fairly, the, the probability to get this sample from this picture is high. The probability to get this sample from this picture is fairly low. We always have already a picture in mind. And this actually, this having that in mind is actually called the null hypothesis. So whenever you go for the p-value, you have to have a picture in mind. You have to have some results already in mind. That is the definition of the null hypothesis. And then you ask, what is 
the probability to get the observed sample. And what we can say is, if the probability is low, and you probably remember that, if P is low, H0 must go. If P is high, H0 can can sty exactly. You have a beautiful Australian accent. Yeah? So if the probability is low, we can say not although we see that the probability that we get this from this picture is very low, so we throw the picture away. Our null hypothesis is rejected, exactly. Yeah? As I say here. We reject the null hypothesis. Can we accept the null hypothesis? Can we accept the null? Think about it. We say, right, the probability that this sample comes from that picture is fairly high. Yeah? The probability that this sample is from this picture is fairly high. Can we say that this sample comes from this picture? Marta goes like that, no? No, we can't say that. It could be also from the lady with the ermine, with the, with the, with the, with the ferret thing. We can't be 100% sure. So the correct phrase is not we accept the null hypothesis. The correct phrase is we simply fail to reject. And please note the difference. Fail to reject is something different to accept. It's a little bit like if I say to you, I love you. No, don't get excited. <laughs> I love you is different to I don't hate you. Right? Yeah. So, accept and fail to reject are two different things. Make sense? So, p-value and confidence intervals both look at similar things, but they are different. The p-value looks at the sample and says, what is the probability that it comes from a picture that I already have in mind? The confidence interval tells us or makes a prediction, actually, what the picture we think looks like. Two different things, very similar. What do people report in scientific journals? Usually, it is the p-value. So usually, the p-value is given. And unfortunately, this is sort of the tendency now. However, people are getting more and more sort of clued up about it. Because if you just give the p-value, it is um, almost like, how shall I say? Yeah, it's almost like you only give a very unusual first name on Tinder. So, for example, you say, my name is Yati. Yeah, it's great. Huh? Hello, Yati. Is Yati male or female? In order to avoid confusion and disappointment, give 
the other part of information. Give the p-value, and again, on my doc, you see how you can calculate p-values, but also give the confidence interval, because as I said, they tell you different things. So Yati, in this case, would be, surprise, surprise, male. Would you have guessed that? Probably not. You would, yeah. <laughs> Because, uh, you know, I just made it up, right? So when you do your analysis, I want you really to think about confidence <coughs> intervals because every experiment, every sample has its own confidence interval. And I want you to report the confidence interval and I want you also to report the p-value. So do both, please. Confidence interval and p-value. And here is the, the link to the document. It is still work in progress, so I haven't totally finished it, and I will work on it uh, over the next uh, few weeks. Uh, with, with more things to, to cover. But always, whatever experiment you do, I want you to think about, oh, what's the confidence interval? And just to give you an example, what I mean. So, for example, you do an enzyme measurement or you do a correlation or something like that or you do some kinetics, whatever you do in your experiment, and you get, let's say, you get a, a curve like a, a straight line like that, whatever the axes are. This straight line actually represents only one sample. And it is really defined by the gradient and the intercept. <coughs> gradient and intercept. But because it is only one example, both gradient and intercept have a confidence interval. And I denote that with a little e here, Greek e. This means there is a certain error in it. And this error just simply comes from the fact that it is only a sample, and a sample always has sampling error. Yeah? So even if you do something really trivial, like a straight line, I want you to bear in mind there is an error in it, and we want to really record a confidence interval for the gradient and the intercept. How this is done, again, I refer you to this guy here. Oop. Come on, baby. Yeah. To this one. Yeah? Any questions about that? Merry Christmas. You deserve a break. Have a good one. Take care. See you at the other side. <laughs>